Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank LAS for inviting me to speak to you tonight about the complexities of importing and exporting research pitch with the emphasis on Europe. Right. Okay, so this is the overview of what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight. So obviously, different countries have different regulations. These different regulations can be because uh, di different countries are looking for different things and what's important to one country may not be important to another. Uh, for example, Australia are very, uh, very interested in protecting their borders from uh, incoming uh, animals that are not native to the country. So they're very, very hot on those kind of things as an island nation. The UK is as well. So I'll also be looking at um, exporting to the USA and then as, as I've just mentioned Australia, I'll also be looking at uh, exporting to Australia and then exporting to the uh, EU countries and then I'll be looking at uh, in a little bit more depth at in importation regulations and the interpretation of those import regulations to EU countries that are specific to the UK. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to look at airline and courier regulations and then finally I'll be looking at IATA regulations. Okay so as I said different countries different regulations but primarily most countries require the following so that's customs invoices, shippers certification, most countries require some kind of health certification and within those countries, uh, in institutions are going to vary with their internal requirements. For example, in the UK, I sometimes, um, I will export things to different institutions within the UK, some of which require health certification and others don't. Um, legally speaking, and I'm not gonna be talking about this, um, all, all laboratory fish are covered by the ASPA Act, which is the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act, and most places do not require a health certification under that particular act. It's just an institutional um, uh, requirement. Okay, so these are just two examples of what a customs invoice might say. So you're going to need to give a date, you may need to put it on headed note paper. This one on our left hand side is our UCL headed note paper. Sometimes you don't require that. You do need to obviously say who the shipper is. You need to then say who, who it's going to and what the contents are. And this, the contents will vary depending on who you're shipping to uh, well, and obviously what you're actually shipping. And then you have to say how much value they have when you're usually, certainly at UCL, and usually when you are shipping uh, zebrafish embryos or zebrafish themselves for research purposes, they don't actually have, um, they don't have a commercial value. So we always put some, a very low value on them. And then these things are required for people to, you have to sign them. So that's custom invoices. This is a shipper's certification. I have to thank World Courier at this point for allowing me to show you this. And this is just basically telling you. Uh, so again, it's very similar to a customs invoice. It, it tells you what your what is being uh, shipped, and you you know these are. So this is for the airline. Um, again, very similar to a customs invoice. And this is a health certification. So these can come, like sometimes people are prepared to have health certification signed on headed note paper and they can sometimes be signed by people like me. So I head up a facility, I'm not a vet, but some places that this is the health certification you require. Other places do require that you have health certification signed by a vet. Uh, it, again, it all depends on A, on the institution, and sometimes it depends on the country you're shipping to. Uh, Australia don't require that a vet would, um, would, would sign off on a health certification. Okay. So if you're exporting to the USA, 
you need the following things, a customs invoice, a shipper's certification, a health certification, and again, the institute to where you are, uh, to whom you are, are shipping, will, their, their requirements will vary. But so these are for the US and Canada as well, so maybe the ship in North America would just require these things. So these are amongst the most simple exports that you can do. So, so these are the th three things that I've already shown you. The customs invoice, the shipper certification, and a health certification. I've never shipped to anywhere in the USA that had, or Canada that has required me to have a vet signed health declaration of any description. So I always sign this off myself. Um, so if you're exporting to Australia, now you're talking about a country that has very strict border controls. So you do need a shipper's declaration and you also need an AQIS import permit, which has to be, so it's the institute that you ship to has to raise this. So this is a six page permit, which goes through absolutely everything that you could imagine. And it's, so, and it will ask you how you're shipping, what exactly you're shipping, what you're shipping in, all kinds of things. It's, you have a very detailed health certification has, which has to be signed off by a vet going over there. And within the import permit, this contains the detailed instructions for the shipper, the exporter of the import regulations and instructions. And so, and it, so it's not just to the exporter, I should say, it's also to the importer. Shipping to, the, to Australia is amongst one of the most complex places you could ship to. Okay, and so this is what is required. So as I've told you, uh, your uh, AQIS uh, importation document is six pages long. You have to follow that very, very thoroughly. You still have a shipper's exportation, uh, shipper certification. You have an additional health certification, and you also have a customs invoice. Okay, so now I want to talk about importing into the EU. So this is under. So uh, I'm guessing that everybody knows that the EU first came about because. Uh, it was to help like trade between some of the, um, the European countries and since then it's grown um, in it, it, it's kind of outlook I suppose and now we we constantly you know we're thinking about you know how we um, make our regulations you know, all tie up together this doesn't really work that well in some instances and this is one of these instances but this so this is the regulation that you're supposed to follow to import um, aquatic things into the into uh, into the EU. So it's Commission Regulation EU number three four six stroke twenty ten, which was an amendment of a two thousand and eight regulation. And so this is basically telling you how you can import things into the uh, EU. Okay, and as a, so this comes from a directive from two, uh, 2006, which was the health, uh, animal health requirements for aquatic animals and products of them. So this is basically to protect European borders from various diseases that fish carry. Uh, so you might think that some of the, some of the zebrafish stuff that we do because none of those diseases are actually applicable to um, zebrafish and certainly not to zebrafish in research which does make it somewhat strange but i'll come on to that later okay so this is another part of that regulation so this is telling you that you have to have certification and you have to have requirements for the market and the import into the community of aquaculture animals. And um, in the UK define aquaculture, uh, so the UK define research animals as part, of that, as part of aquaculture. So again, it's telling you you have to do these things. So although that's the way that the uh, UK define these things, it's not 
it, it, this interpretation varies from member state to member state. So some countries will have a totally different interpretation of, uh, of, of these regulations. And some countries, in fact, don't actually define um, don't actually define laboratory fish as aquaculture. So they have can quite often have lesser importation um, requirements than somewhere like the UK. So somewhere like Germany has uh, has an has an interpretation of the, of these regulations, which is much closer to the UK than say the Belgium or French interpretation of these. Uh, of the, these um, regulations. Okay, so in the UK, so in 2010, this is actually, it's not 2008, we originally had decided that, well, CFAS, who are, who are the governmental body who determine what importation regulations and a fish come under, originally wanted health certification using something called model animal health certification for the import into the European community of ornamental aquatic animals intended for close, closed or ornamental facilities. Now that was okay, So, but what that meant was that once we'd imported animals into the UK, we couldn't then share them with any of our collaborators in the UK or push them on to anywhere else because closed means exactly that, that they come into your facility and that's where they stay. And not only those animals, but the pro progeny of those animals. So I think it's pretty fair to say that the majority of people in the UK didn't realise that uh, we would, that we were supposed to be importing animals and then keeping them in our own facility so we were sharing we were sharing different lines of fish and then we got told by CFAS that actually we couldn't do that but because uh, so this is what they did to help us so they changed our certification from the original one of closed ornamental facilities onto um, aquatic animals for farming relaying put and take fisheries and open ornamental facilities which meant we could trade uh, our, we can trade our fish with other people using animals in research in research however so this is what you need to do it so I this is my uh, this is the uh, uh, authorization to um, operate an aquatic production business in the UK which is what is the legislation that we're working under uh, this is the one for, this is an example and it's our one from UCL. So no one can bring anything into the UK from outside. You could bring them in from Europe, from uh, the EU, but you can't bring them in from anywhere outside the, the uh, European Union unless you have uh, a, a certification like that. So this is what I was telling you about uh, originally. So this is the, so this is, uh, the certification that has to be filled in by um, by the people that you're importing from. And this was the original one, which was for closed ornamental facilities. And this is the one that we have to fill in nowadays. And this is the one that allows us to be, if we, if we bring in things from outside of the EU, this allows us to share those, um, to share those fish with other facilities on other uh, other scientific institutions. So, okay. so I should point out that some people have said to me because because of the ASPA Act, which is uh, regulated by the Home Office, the ASPA Act says that nothing under five days post fertilisation is counted. So a lot of people get quite confused about that and think that that's a CFAS regulation. It's not a CFAS regulation. CFAS say that you need certification to bring in fish or larval forms from third countries. And so third countries just means countries outside of the EU. Um, 
So that's only thing. in fact, even if you're bringing in sperm samples, you will still need the same certification to do that. But if, because of these two different pieces of legislation coming from two different governmental bodies, people do quite often become confused. But it does, you do need to have, uh, you do need to have certification for either fish or larval forms. Okay, so why did we change from one to another? Well, I've already alluded to that really. Uh, the idea of going on from closed ornamental facilities to open ornamental facilities was to make the import of zebrafish into the UK easier. Uh, it's a bit debatable whether that is really true or not, and there's lots of people who say that it's not that true. And that's because it requires fish to be signed off by an authority in the country, of a, by an official, official governmental body in the, UK, in the uh, country of export. Now in the USA, that authority is the uh, USDA, it's not fisheries and wildlife. So the problems with, that, with this certification are, uh, I don't think, and a lot of other people don't think, that this is really designed for um, fish that are to be used in uh, research of any kind. So you have, there's a commodities certification, I'm going to come on to that and show you what I mean by that. And it does require these approved veterinary sign-offs. So an approved governmental veterinary sign-off. So in order in the US to be able to have that sign-off, you need to have your facility um, registered or you need to have authority from the USDA to say that you are some kind of aquaculture facility and they need to do an inspection of it. Uh, so it's quite a complicated procedure for the people who have to who are, you know, who have um, colleagues in the UK to have to go through just so that they can set, so they can share their uh, fish with, with their colleagues in, and uh, collaborators in the UK. And some countries, and this would be, and so here this is Japan, have just flatly, flatly refused to do any governmental sign off of research animals. I don't know this, but I would speculate that that's probably, they do, they will do it with carp, but I think that's probably because that's a commercial interest to them and it's not to, um, uh, and research animals just aren't of that, don't have that kind of commercial interest. Okay, so this is a commodity certification. Now, if you look at this, you can see, let me just try something here. Uh, if you look here, you can see that not, they're not pets, they're not necessarily for breeding, they're certainly not for quarantine, they're certainly not for circus or exhibition, they're not usually for relaying, so and um, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, you can put other, but then, and sometimes we've been told that what we should do is write another box and say they're for research. However, this has a problem when they come into the UK, they say our certification is wrong and uh, they probably threatened to prosecute me many times over these, these certifications being incorrect. And this is the other thing that I was telling you about. Unless this is, unless this is signed off by uh, an official uh, vet, then this will also be, this could mean that, you know, I'll either, you know, they'll either turn this around when it gets into the UK or more than likely what they usually do is threaten to prosecute people like me. Um, so this does need to be signed off, as I say, in the US, uh, it's a USDA, varies from country to country. And this is the thing that the Japanese have said that they won't sign off for research animals. So this has really given us like quite a few problems because uh, we do, you know, the UK do have Japanese, and this is just an example, the UK do have Japanese um, 
collaborators. So we've either had to bring things in as constructs, or so on occasions we've had to bring them into the EU, into the EU through countries who don't use this kind of legislation to import research animals, and then we've had to import them from other EU countries where it's easier to, it's easier to actually obtain animals from. So it's you know, in some ways it's it's uh, just making life a little bit difficult for scientists. Actually. The way I've got around um, um, around this this idea in uh, at UCL is that I've created two quarantine areas. So one quarantine area is where animals can be transferred to other UK locations. So this is one using the Oakland Ornamental Fish Certification. And the other one, I've got had to go back to using the closed, um, closed facility um, uh, certification. So uh, I can only keep animals there and their progeny can only stay at this location. So we can't, we can't share these animals with anybody else. And this is how we're the only, this, I believe that we're the only place in the UK that actually employs this um, in, employs this way of importing animals and the on, only reason that we did is because I just had to keep talking to CFAS, the governmental body who deal with all this thing and saying this is the only way that we'll be able to import so, some of our animals from some of our collaborators in some countries. A bit of a nuisance. But um, okay, the other thing to bear in mind is that airlines and couriers can have regulations as well. So uh, in the UK, there are only two airlines that will handle animals use it, experimental animals. And that's really because of, uh, like we have, there are lots of uh, anti vivisection um, societies and movements and though they're quite active in the UK, although they're not as active as they currently are on, uh, in continental Europe, but uh, they will basically harass airlines until airlines just, you know, they, they, they don't want the trouble of it, and they, so they stop taking on experimental animals. Uh, there are only limited couriers that you can use. So FedEx, uh, for example, in, the, in Europe, will not carry live, live animals. So we are limited on the couriers that we can use. And sorry, and I've already talked about the limited airlines prepared to accept research animals. So you need to think uh, if you, about that. Uh, if you are if you are thinking of exporting into the UK. I would suggest that you use a specialist courier rather than just putting things in boxes. Okay, so I asked the regulations. So um, you need to use one third of water, two thirds of oxygen or air, uh, double bagged in polythene bags, um, packed in a polystyrene insulation box and an outer cardboard box. They have, should be going with IATA labels, live animals in this way up, and you should be able to go airport to airport in 48 hours. So this is for adult animals, and this is just a little thing that shows you uh, how to, to pack the animals, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is your... Uh, uh, polythene bag, this is your inner polystyrene box, and this is your outer cardboard box. That's how you need to transport, uh, if you're using airlines, this is how you need to transport fish. Uh, this is adult fish. I also have no regulations whatsoever for embryonic forms, so that would be more about how you uh, how you want to transport them. I would see, we usually transport in a uh, culture vessel. So, and again, we follow this one third water, two thirds air thing. That's what we do at UCL. So 
my conclusions are that there are different regulations uh, and they are country dependent and as I said as, as I said at the beginning this is going to really depend on what the, com the country of uh, import what the, uh, the country to which you're exporting what they require and what they're looking for as a as I said like they, they do differ in EU countries and how they determine how they're going to regulate things. Some countries are much easier to export to than others, uh, but the IATA regulations remain the same no matter where, you, uh, where you're importing and exporting to. Okay, I'd just like to acknowledge my, uh, the uh, UCL fish team so because uh, obviously I can't be here doing this if they're not there doing their jobs. Any questions? Right, let's have a little look here. Ah, okay, so there are no questions. So I would like to thank you all uh, for listening and I will hand back to Ros. Thank you very much. Thank you.